as the global population grows, we all need to get better at managing our world's resources, whether it's water, energy or food. How can we maximize what we have without degrading the planets for the future? Welcome to Eco Africa. I am Chris Alems in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you, Chris. And once again, we've got solutions for you with everyday people just getting on with the job. I am Sandra Kahumza Twinobio, right here in Kampala, Uganda. Here is what we have coming up. The popular Kenyan TV show that is inspiring a new wave of young agricultural entrepreneurs and helping marine life in the Mediterranean by cleaning up heavy metals and educating the public. And how recycling batteries prevents a host of toxic metals entering the environment. But we begin in northern Ghana, where rising temperatures and changing rainfall patterns mean conditions are now drier than ever before. It is, of course, a problem Africa-wide. But in rural parts of Ghana's Upper East region, many are forced to spend hours each day collecting drinking water. It is a task that largely falls to the women, impacting their lives and livelihoods. But one community has found a way to better manage this precious resource, bringing multiple benefits. Whenever water comes to the surface, Amina Mohammed scoops it up, slowly, painstakingly. She and the other women of Anaphobisi collect what they can at a reservoir that's run dry. To restore its capacity, it would need to be dug deeper, but there's no money for that here. When the dry season starts, our struggles for water begin. We spend many hours looking for it every day. We pray that someone will help us dredge our dam. If we spent less time searching for water, we'll probably have more time to do work that could improve our lives. This part of Ghana has been hard hit by climate change. Drought is common, and when the dry season finally ends, the rains are usually so intense that flooding ensues as the water runs off the hard, dry soil rather than replenishing the groundwater. About 4,000 people live in the village of Anafobisi, near the border of Burkina Faso. They share the water from three wells and two boreholes. Just how much can be pumped out varies throughout the day. Analysts say drilling more boreholes would do little to alleviate the water scarcity. Some have even been capped because they've run dry or because the water had too much fluoride, which can harm teeth and bones. And so we need to go a step further to find out how we can help communities to secure the water resource itself. In Anafo BC, volunteer Mercy Aduko now monitors closely how much water is actually available. Many residents came today before dawn to fetch water. By about 8 a.m., the level had dropped from 12 meters to about 50 centimeters, as so often in the dry season. Now the community has to decide how to get through the day with what remains. We do this one to help our community people. When uh, there is more water, we fight to do for our home work. But there is time that, uh, a period of time that the water will reduce. And this area, we are lack of water. We are not getting water. So this world, if we are using it to do building and construction or uh, other things, the water will not reach the time we want to be using. Tracking rainfall amounts also helps the community become more resilient. Here, another volunteer from the village talks to local farmers about how long-term rain patterns affect groundwater levels. It's crucial information that will help the farmers decide which crops to plant this year. When the rain falls, we now look at them, they tell us, they explain to us, and then we also do to understand. So when the rain falls, Every year, the year that is first in a time way, then we also follow the way they talk to us. And then we also follow the, 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 the right way for transplanting. Meanwhile, Mercy Aduko is about to brief a group of villagers 
who are waiting to hear about today's water level. And as so often, she tells them there's not much left. That means construction work in the village has to stay on hold. They cannot afford to use the water to make concrete. The group decides how to ration the remaining water, who can use what's left, and for what purpose. This common approach helps reduce the sort of conflicts about water, which used to be common. People would take whatever they please. Some might come with four drums, even though we were supposed to take less to make it go round. It always led to arguments. Today, Apala Ayamga's household has been allocated just a few litres from the village well. Still, the water plan helps her manage her time more effectively. If the well had run dry for the day, she would have had to walk many kilometres to fetch the water she needs. But now, she has time to make her dawa dawa spice blend, which she sells for extra income. Telling us how much water is available helps us know when to fetch water and when to work on our businesses. We can plan how to use the water and still get other work done. The people of Anafo BC are coping with the water scarcity as best they can. Digging out the dried up reservoir could help, but so far it hasn't been a political priority. That's part of why the community here feels abandoned by the government. Measuring groundwater won't fix Anaphobesis water scarcity, but it does help the community share what it has more fairly and live more peacefully and gives them a better chance of coping with climate adversity. Water shortage is one problem. Another is water pollution, whether it is fresh water bodies or the oceans. Our next story takes us to the Mediterranean. That's right, Sandra. The sea off the coast of North Africa and Southern Europe is awash with plastic and heavy metals. It's bad for marine life and for people. In Spain, painstaking cleanup efforts are underway. Short snouted seahorses, soft corals, Neptune grass, gropers, and a wide variety of seaweed inhabit the Mediterranean waters off Murcia in southeastern Spain. With 73 kilometers of coast and the biggest saltwater lagoon in Europe, it's a paradise for recreational fishing. But many fishermen use lead sinkers. They can end up on the seabed, where they pose a threat to marine life. Let's take the case of a fish feeding on algae growing on a piece of lead. When that fish approaches and begins eating the algae, it also ingests the lead. It becomes part of the marine food chain, the small fish being eaten by the bigger fish and so on. The lead is passed from one to the other until finally we, as seafood consumers, wind up with that lead on our plate. Some fishers are starting to use alternative sinkers made of ceramic or zinc. But the UN estimates some 640,000 tons of fishing gear, including hazardous metals, still ends up in our oceans each year. To combat the problem, volunteers from Hippocampus, an organization focused on the conservation of short-snouted seahorses, have launched the Plumboom Project. Plumboom is an idea. Plum Boom is a project born after so many dives, where we saw so much rubbish made from metal, from lead used in sport fishing and professional fishing. Nets loaded with lead sinkers, for example. To remove the metals from the sea, the project relies on a vast network of volunteer divers, like Felix Arias Herantz. Today, he's joining a cleaning expedition at Cabo de Palos, a seaside village in one of the most biodiverse areas in the Mediterranean basin. We're going to collect lead from the sea floor, mainly marine weights and hooks from fishing gear, small pieces that settle on the bottom and get half buried. Let's see if we get lucky.
With the help of metal detectors, divers can collect between 4 and 45 kilos of lead at each cleaning. The results are registered on a website that monitors their efforts. Since 2017, more than 14,000 metal sinkers, equivalent to one ton of lead, have been removed from the Mediterranean. But Plumboom doesn't just remove the metal, it also contributes to the circular economy by giving it a second life. Thanks to public funds and private contributions, 200 containers have been distributed at diving centers and yacht clubs along the coast. Here, all divers can deposit pieces they've salvaged. We put the lead here. Then the association collects it and takes it to the companies we have an agreement with. They can recycle the metal so it can be used again in batteries, for example. Once the containers are full, the project coordinators bring them back to the Heavy Metals Recovery Center. To date, they've delivered more than 900 kilos for recycling. In addition to encouraging the use of sustainable sinkers, Plumboom is working with governments to implement eco-friendly marine policies. And it's appealing to all people to stop throwing trash into the sea. Staying in Europe, we head to Poland now where an activist and a network of volunteers are trying to tackle another source of pollution from lead and other toxic metals, batteries, dead batteries. Right now, far too many are ending up in landfills. This week's Doing Your Bits. They might look harmless, but they're very toxic. Just one can contaminate a cubic meter of soil. For 15 years, Dominik Dobrowolski has been trying to stop batteries ending up in the ground here in Poland. They contaminate water, soil and the air. Batteries contain mercury, cadmium, lithium and lead. 2,500 communities are taking part in the recycling drive this spring. 1,000 organizations, schools and universities are also joining in the week's long initiative, setting up collecting boxes so people can bring in their old batteries. In Poland, less than half of all batteries sold are recycled. That means more than 150 million of them end up in the environment. The difference between Poland and Germany, for example, is that battery manufacturers in Germany do a lot more to support the recycling system than the same manufacturers or battery retailers in Poland. Until the government does something about this, Dominik Dobrowolski and a network of organizations are doing what they can to provide funding, transport the collection boxes and carry out the recycling. Last year, they collected one million batteries, but the activist wants to go much further. We have to ensure that batteries and other trash is separated from the outset at home. That way, they won't contaminate other materials and can be sorted and recycled more easily. A million batteries that didn't end up in landfill. That's already a big achievement. Finding alternative sources of power is a challenge the world over, and perhaps nowhere more so than in Africa's rural communities, which often lack access to electricity. In Zimbabwe, one young engineering student has come up with a bright idea, and it's a win-win solution. Even after nightfall, these young people in the rural community of Mahusekwa some 70 kilometers southeast of Zimbabwe's capital, Harare, to not have to put their books away. That's thanks to these solar-powered lights that are made from recycled materials. In Zimbabwe, roughly 70% of the rural population have no access to electricity. The only lights that used to be available here came from kerosene lamps. 25-year-old Aluane Mayonga is an electrical engineering graduate, an inventor of what he calls the Chigubu lantern. Chigubu roughly translates as a plastic container. 
home we had a lot of uh solar solar led lights that were no longer functioning and that time i think i was doing some basics of electronics at school so i figured out that i could be able to fix these lights the challenge that i faced that time was the challenge of the casing so that's when i thought maybe i could just put this uh the light that i had fixed in a plastic waste bottle using discarded plastic bottles my younger has now made more than 500 lanterns which he's mainly distributed in rural communities they not only help young people their study they contribute to a circular economy we are reusing plastic waste hence we are reducing the amount of waste that is reaching our dump sites then at the same time the lanterns are charged using solar power which is a green source of energy Zimbabwe generates about 1.9 million tons of waste annually. Nearly 20% of that is plastics. To maximize the impact of his invention, Aluwain Mayonga is teaching young people how to build their own lanterns. The elementary school he's visiting today is completely off-grid. I believe in educating these young people because they are the future. If they are more knowledgeable on how best they can solve uh, the problem of plastic waste, I think our future will be more sustainable. The young inventor has also installed a solar system at the school, which allows the students to charge their lanterns during the day. I'm excited about making Chigubu lantern as it is teaching us on how to keep the environment clean. According to the school authorities, the students' grades have improved now that they can keep studying after dark. This has actually motivated our children to do their studies well because they are able to do their homework at, at home and also do their studies using, using the lights. They go and use the light at night and tomorrow morning when they come back to school, they bring the light with them and it is charged. And then in the evening when they return home, they go with their light. So we are essentially culturing a sustainable mindset in them so that when they grow up, they know what's right to do for the environment, what's right to do for the climate, uh, for the planet, and that will help us in our fight against climate change. Aluwain Mayonga's aim is to bring light to more communities without access to electricity. In the long run, he hopes to set up a factory to manufacture the affordable lighting solution on a larger scale. Now, it's not often here on Eco Africa that we promote another TV show. But in Kenya, a pioneering series on farming is bringing real change to the country. And change is what we are all about here. Yeah, guys, you're going to love this. Every week, millions of Kenyans tune in to Shamba Shepa. It is funny. It's lively and it helps farmers increase their yields and take care of the planet. Now, some viewers have been inspired to take up farming themselves. Take a look. This is Julian from Limuru. And this is George Kairu, a qualified accountant turned farmer. Although he grew up here in rural Limuru, the switch was challenging. Initially, his two dairy cows didn't produce much milk. But then he appeared on television. Welcome to Shamba Shepa. This week, we are in Limuru. His participation in the Kenyan TV show Shamba Shape Up changed everything. Getting help from his sister. Before the Shamba Shape Up came in my farm, I could I had less than, actually I was doing 15 to 10 liters per day from several animals. But when the Shamba Shape Up came, I've been able even to make more profits and more production up to 100 liters a day. Thanks to advice from a dairy farm expert to change the animal feed, he was able to boost the productivity of his cows. Today he has eight of them. George Kairu also cultivates maize and grows tea. Both are highly water intensive and that's a considerable expense. 
the TV show supports the farmers here too. It's partnered with various companies which provide the farmers with materials and supplies, such as animal feed, fertilizer and even equipment, in return for product placement in the TV show. They really helped me by installing a water pump and a solar panel. It has really helped me to lower the operation costs from the farm. And I'm so grateful for that. Hold on, Carlo, hold on! Tony! Ah! So many shambas to shape. Welcome to Shamba Shape Up! We have traveled all over East Africa to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need. So they can adapt and make their farms more productive even while the climate changes. Shamba is the Swahili word for garden or farm. The point of the show is edutainment. Farmers get advice on practices and methods. It's been running on TV in Kenya since 2012. One of the hosts is actor Tony Jaguna. He's been on board since the very beginning. And we don't go alone, we go with our experts. For instance, if you're planting maize, we go with an expert who deals with maize. We explain to the farm about the uh, importance of good seed, how to plant it on the ground, how to take care of it, all the way up to the harvesting and uh, sometimes even marketing. Welcome. The show is financed by various NGOs and international scientific institutes in Kenya. The 30-minute show is a weekly format. It's always filmed on a different farm and focuses on a specific set of problems and solutions. One important aspect is showing farmers how they can better protect against climate change. Conservation agriculture is important in fighting climate change because farmers are able to get a good harvest because without using conservation agriculture, they will go at losses. Uh, conservation agriculture again helps in replenishing the environment because when you tell farmers to plant trees, you know, uh, we tell farmers to minimal tillage where they don't harm the environment. And, that, that, and uh, you, uh, good use of water. So farmers are able to harvest water, they're able to use minimal water so that we still save our rivers. Today the team is in Kisumu in Western Kenya. They're visiting Eric Ojio, who has been a farmer all his life. The first thing that I noticed that they work with professionals. Like me, I've done this project for a long time, but I've learned a lot by them coming with professionally different fields. Like uh, yesterday, they came with uh, an expert in trees. I learned about trees. He needs some advice about these chicks, which aren't growing as well as they could. An employee with an animal feed company explains that Eric needs to add enzymes to his chicken feed. The show wants to reach as many farmers as possible. Around 70% of Kenya's population live in rural areas and work in agriculture. But rural exodus is a serious problem. Young people in particular are keen to move to the city and get office jobs, which pay better than jobs in agriculture. It's a problem that farmer Eric Ogio knows all too well. Most youth doesn't want to do this job because they see it as a small thing. Some, somebody who has gone to school should not be doing this. That is why they're not doing it. The programme aims to show that farming is financially attractive and meaningful work. It reaches up to 12 million viewers in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania and Zambia. Some shows are also produced in these countries too. Studies have shown that after two years of airing, several hundred thousand households were regularly tuning in to watch and altering their farming practices as a result. The biggest achievement is changing livelihoods. Because when we look back at the farmers who have adapted to the methods we've shown them, using our experts and they have accepted it and they have accepted to change and use modern, meth modern farming methods, they have achieved a lot of success. Hello. Hello. The team check up on George Cairo too, a year after their first visit. <laughs> are these the same, same cows? Yeah, they are the ones. Are you sure? Sure. No. Viewers can see how helpful the expert advice has been. 
one more reason why the show is so popular. Brilliant. That's it for this edition of Eco Africa. Thank you for watching. I am Sandra Kahomza Twinovio saying bye bye from Kampala, right here in Uganda. Bye, Sandra. See you again next time. And to all our viewers out there, if you have any ideas on how to look after our beautiful planet, then write and share them with us. We love hearing from you. Until then, check out our social media accounts. I am Chris Alem signing off from Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs>